So my name is Abigail, and I'm going to be um, presenting on factors affecting anthocyanin concentrations in purple basil. Um, so um, I decided to study purple basil just because of it's one of the most popular culinary herbs that a lot of people eat. It has a lot of nutrients and vitamins that um, you gain when you eat these mineral when you eat the plant, and also. Um, it has antioxidant and antibacterial properties. Um, so one of the main components um, that, give, that give anthocyanins, I mean, sorry, purple basil, um, those antioxidant properties are anthocyanins. Um, and they are a large class of flavonoids, the largest class of flavonoids in plants. That's what actually gives it the purple color um, from the red and blue pigments in the plant. Um, and it's re often recognized to help with plant growth, development, and reproduction of plants. And these on the left-hand side are the two most common um, anthocyanins that are found in purple basils, the cyanidine and the peonidine. So anthocyanins play an important role. Um, First of all, in plants, they play an important role through UV protection and also inhibit, inhibition of pathogens on the plants. And when consumed by humans, they have anti-carcinogenic and anti-inflammatory um, benefits to us. The main goal of our research was to analyze um, how the purple basil anthocyanin production is affected by stressors such as soil bacteria, herbivory, and drought. So the methods which we, which we use, um, it was six seeds were placed per square um, in, and grown for 21 days. And then from there, they were actually, um, that's when the treatment started. And for the bacterial treatment, um, it was, they placed seven ml of pseudonomous um, culture um, and also seven ml of just regular water. And that was watered onto the plants um, three times a week. Um, so for the non-bacterial, it was just seven ml of regular water and seven ml of sterile water that was watered onto the plants. And for to induce the drought, drought stress, um, the water, the plants were watered instead of three times a week, they were watered twice a week on Monday and Friday. There was also a third um, um, factor, the herbivory. So to induce the herbivory on the plants, the treatment started at week, eight weeks um, from, um, from the time that the other treatments from the time they were planted and they did it five times. And what, how they did that is they actually hole punched the, they hole punched the plants to induce that stress onto it. So after 10 weeks, the plants were harvested um, from the treat, from their um, respective treatments. Then they were frozen in liquid nitrogen and ground up through a mulcher and pestle. And finally, um, the samples were freeze, or they were um, speed backed for three and a half hours at 400 degrees, uh, 40 degrees Celsius and weighed for their dried weight. Um, so in order to actually extract the anthocyanin from the plant, you had to um, perform um, a, a process in which you would soak the um, kind of, you would soak the plant into the into a solution of hydrochloric acid um, in their little in their black um, centrifuge tubes, and then from there they were sonified for at room temperature for 40 minutes, and then centrifuge for 30 minutes, um, and the supernatant that was produced from these plants were then removed, and that's what was actually analyzed for the anthocyanins. And so for the analysis, um, we used actually, we used the chrominin um, standard curve, which was then um, with a range from 7.8 to 250 milligrams per ml. And for the buffers, there were, um, there were two buffers which were used, the um, potassium chloride and the sodium acetate. Um, this potassium chloride had a pH of one 
and the sodium acetate had a pH of 4.5. And so that the samples were, act, were analyzed at 500 nanometers and 700 nanometers using a spectrophotometer. So the main reason why this, the samples were analyzed at two different pHs or uh, with the buffer, they were placed in the two different buffers is that when um, the anthocyanins are placed in a pH of one, you'll actually see on the actual, uh, when you place a sample into the buffer, it will glow red or pinkish color. Um, and when it's placed in a pH of 4.5, it will produce no color. So essentially, if you, and if you analyze it at 520 nanometers, you will see a color production. And then at 700, you shouldn't see any color production for both, um, just because it should, um, anthocyanins are usually, they don't go up to 700 nanometers on the spectrum. They're not seen at 700. So for the results, um, there were, for the, treat, for the main point objective, because this is a lot to see on a graph, um, when the, it was a non-drought and bacterial treatment, we saw actually a reduction in the total anthocyanin production um, when, the, when the treatment was just um, the bacterial. So when a plant was not in any bacterial, was in a no drought and bacterial treatment, they saw a decrease in the total anthocyanin concentration when compared to the control. And when the, it was placed in a drought and bacterial treatment, there was actually a significant increase when you compared it to the controls of that statement, of the um, control versions of the same treatments. Um, this is theorized that when the plants are placed in a drought condition, the bacteria, the bacteria will actually help with the intake of the plant nutrients. Um, so um, because the actual bacteria are, um, they're soil bacteria, so they're often along the roots of the plant. So in a, within a drought, they will still aid in the um, collection of nutrients into the plant, even though it's still a drought condition. Um, so when there were, the plant was induced with three different stressors, um, we actually saw a significant decrease in the total anthocyanin concentration um, produced by the plants. And finally, uh, we saw a similar when it was just two variations um, where there was no drought and bacterial and herbivory treatment, you saw an increase. So the main takeaway from this um, is that um, when we were analyzing, we did see a significant difference in the anthocyanin levels among the several, the various replicate groups. But we saw that two, when two stressors are placed onto the plant, there was an increase in anthocyanin levels. And also when three stressors is added, when there are three stressors onto the plant, you actually see a significant decrease in anthocyanin levels. Um, so for our next steps in our project, um, we want to reanalyze the samples just to make sure that um, there wasn't any, uh, there wasn't a significant error when we were analyzing the samples um, so that um, we can verify that the, what we, our results were valid. And we also want to analyze the mechanism behind why those stressors reduced the anthocyanin concentration. Um, mainly just because of the bacteria when it was in a regular no drought condition and when the plants are placed with no drought but a bacterial um, environment, we saw a significant decrease in the anthocyanin levels. And so with that, I would like to thank Dr. Niemeyer for um, support and aiding in this project. Um, I would also like to thank Lucas. He's the one who actually started the project and I just picked up after him. I'd like to thank um, the Welch Foundation and the Kate and Herbert Dishman Endowment Fund at, from Southwestern for funding. Questions? Thank you very much, Abby. I really like your diagrams um, for your presentation. Let's see. Um, we have some questions here. Dr. Wigan? No, I forgot to uh, drop ah. my <laughs> Okay, let's go to Ethan. 
Good job, Abby. Um, so I was curious about the stressors and I was also curious if, um, what your thoughts were on say, like would a change in altitude also correlate to a decrease or increase in anthocyanin production? Um, and then similarly, I guess the change in um, light source. And right. if you guys have ever kind of thought about looking into those stressors as well. Um, I'm not sure about altitude, um, but from what I was reading, so the anthocyanins are mostly on, on the leaves, basically. Mm. So I do believe um, that light might affect, um, if there's not enough light, there might be a decrease in anthocyanin production, mm -hmm. but I don't know about altitude um, and how that might affect it. Awesome. And then the bacteria that you chose, I forgot, was that something that was commonly commonly found in, say, their, their natural environment? Or was that introduced merely as like a, a stressor for the system? Um, it's a natural, because it's actually just regular, it's just soil bacteria. Uh -huh. So um, it was very common. Um, it's just a common soil bacteria that was used for the sample, for the, because we wanted to just, um, they wanted us to inhibit a reg, like if the plant was out in nature mm -hmm. and if, um, the main stresses which my a plant might experience when out in nature. Interesting. Okay. Awesome. Uh, I think, yeah, that was, that was it. Good, good job. Let's see. Um, Dr. Massey. Hi, nice talk, Abby. Thank you. Um, so you, you mentioned kind of some of the functions of the anthocyanin um, in the plant. And so why might it be, I guess, um, you know, is the, is the increase in the anthocyanin concentration actually helping the plant deal with some of the stress or is the increase um, a sign that the plant is, is healthy and actually not stressed? The increase in anthocyanin levels actually help the plant survive. So the, the more anthocyanin they produce, um, the more likely it is to thrive. So um, we were just analyzing how much stress that um, this plant can essentially take. Cause like when we did, when we did two stressors, they were, they saw a significant increase in the anthocyanin levels. But when the third stressor was produced, um, there was actually a decrease, which might um, indicate that the plant might not be um, doing so good. Um, so it might, yeah. So the more anthocyanin levels, it's a good thing. Um, that the plant is actually able to um, kind of like protect itself from and enough to be able to grow. Is it like, a, I mean, it's, it's compensating. Yeah, it's compensating. For anthocyanin to compensate for the fact that it's under stress? Yes. Okay. Um, and I think Ethan had asked something about like the light. I was thinking even about like the colors of the light because this anthocyanin complex or molecule, you know, is absorbing, I guess, in the, in the red, um, if it's around 700 nanometers, that there might be some, some differences in the growth spectrum um, and then how the concentration of anthocyanin changes. Okay, let's see who's next. Uh, Dr. Swell. Hi, Abby. Great Hi. job. Um, I just, of course, I'm going to ask you about bacteria. <laughs> like, why did you choose that type? And then how much, I know you said you added like a certain volume, but like how much, um, how, like how much did you add or how did you know at what point to add that amount? So uh, for the bacteria, they were actually um, grown in petri dishes. Um, I'm not sure how much they added. Um, they just, um, what they did is they allowed, before they were, they were gonna place the bacteria onto the plants for treatment, they allowed the bacteria to grow for 24 hours. Okay. And then they took the media from that solution and then added water and then put it onto the plants. Okay, so you don't know like if you needed a number of cells per milliliter or something like that, if there's a certain OD that no, you I, added, just let it no, go. I don't know. And then why that particular strain? The strain? You know? I, was, I don't know. I'm Because um, when I was analyzing, when I was looking at other papers, um, I do believe that 
most of them were using the same, um, the pseudonymous um, okay. soil bacteria when they were analyzing different plants. So I'm theorizing that it's just a common bacteria that's fine in soil. So I know I looked at um, a paper that was um, looking at bacterial effects in roses and they also use the same um, bacterial okay. bacteria. Great, thank you. I'll also chime in there that the person we're collaborating with studies Pseudomonas bacteria. So that's part of the reason that we had chosen those. So these were grown by another group and then we've been analyzing the samples. But um, the Pseudomonas were actually originally taken from the basal roots. So this is a, a bacteria that's normally present in basal. Um, so they wanted to use a bacteria that would normally coexist with the plant too. Okay, um, Dr. William, do you have a question? Oh, very quick. Yes, I do. So, so Abby, what is a good talk? What what is what's magical about the structure of these uh, anthocyanins or this cyanidin in particular that makes these good anti-carcinogens, anti-inflammatories, inhibitors, etc. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, it wasn't a gotcha. I, I'm just, I'm just curious. Um, I, I don't think it's mainly this. I think it's the mechanism which they do when it's in the body um, that actually aids us um, in, in fighting. Um, because um, I know last semester we did a project on flavonoids. Um, for an, our analytical chemistry lab. And it's just the, when they're in the body, they enact different mechanisms to help us with basically with our immune system. So when you eat plants which contain these, it just help aid us with our immune system. And that's how, and it reduces oxidative stress onto, on our cells. That's mainly how they do the anti-carcinogenic and anti-inflammatory roles. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Very good. Okay, very good, Abby. So now 